Okay, uh, it's a pleasure to present to you Professor Zabo from Edinburgh. Uh, uh, he works at, at uh, Heriot Watt University at the Department of Mathematics. Professor Zabo is a, a, a leading in his field, uh, in non computative field, uh, non computative uh, physics, and now he exploring something, something in this direction, and in this in this lecture here, he will present to us some of his new research. So, Professor Zabo, is a pleasure to present to you in this conference. Please, this is yours. All right, thank you, Sergio. So, I'd like to thank Sergio and everyone else for for the invitation um, to give this lecture. Um, I hope everybody's doing well under the current restrictions. Obviously, it would have been a much more delightful thing um, to have an invitation to go to Brasilia and uh, another trip to Brazil, but um, unfortunately, that's that's not happening under the current uh, situation. Um, so, I'm going to talk about some some of the uh, the research I've been um, involved in in the the last eight years or so. Um, I'm going to try to give a pedagogical um, introduction to uh, to some of um, some of the highlights of what I've been working on so here's an outline of what I'm going to um, talk about so the the central focus of what I want to describe and and I chose this topic because um, because of the theme of this year's uh, comp of uh, school um, it, it's you know quantum mechanics foundations and new trends and um, I think a bit of what I'm going to say touches on on both foundational aspects of quantum mechanics and certainly something about new trends um, and the underlying theme here is to talk about non-associativity in quantum mechanics um, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll spend 10 minutes or so giving a, a brief history of, of non-associativity in quantum mechanics. Um, and as I'll discuss, um, this idea is actually very old and, and it traces back to the founding fathers of, uh, of quantum mechanics back in the late 20s and 1930s. And it's a subject which has permeated the physics literature much through the 1980s. Uh, I don't think this is widely appreciated um, and which extent it has permeated the literature. Um, so I'll try to review a bit of these ideas. Um, and then what I want to come to is what's been of interest so far about the last decade now. A lot of these, these ideas of non-associativity in quantum mechanics have now been rekindled through some conjectural descriptions of certain flux compactifications of string theory. Now, a lot of what I'm going to say uh, does not require any detailed knowledge of string theory, although, um, you know, roughly the last half of my talk will use this language a lot, but I'm, uh, uh, you don't have to be an expert in string theory or M theory to understand what I'm going to talk about. So, so if you can just get over some of the jargon and uh, try to absorb kind of the quantitative and technical highlights. So I'll start off with this historical introduction, um, and then I'll move on and, and, and show you a very, very simple physical model where non-associativity is present. I mean, it, it's really, this is concerning the motion of electric charges in, in backgrounds of, of magnetic charge distributions. Okay, so this is a very, very simple model. It's something you could give to a good undergraduate physics student, um, uh, but this is a very, very basic example of non-associativity. And right there, we could learn a lot about what does non-associative quantum mechanics mean in this sense and, and how, how we're going to approach this. So I'll introduce these things I'll call magnetic Poisson brackets. I'll define these. Uh, and then I'll move on and, and talk a bit about the classical and quantum dynamics of electric charges in, in fields of magnetic charge. Okay, this will be the, the, the very simple example. And we'll see even at the classical level, we can learn something about, you know, what is the difference between, you know, motion in a, in a, in a source-free magnetic field and one which is sourced by magnetic charges. Okay. And then I'm going to look at the, the more conjectural applications which are really why 
uh, people have been interested in this in this uh, in these models in the past uh, few years. So we'll we'll look at the case first of closed strings, which move um, in the what are called locally non-geometric flux backgrounds. So I'll give a very kind of working definition of what I what I mean by locally non-geometric flux background. Um, the terms non-geometric here refer to the fact of, uh, of, of uh, geometries that, that can't be described as conventional geometry. So you need some kind of a non-commutative or non-associative description. And then I'm going to talk about how to lift these, um, these ideas up into 11 dimensions into M theory. So we'll first look at, at the analog story for, for membranes or the M2 brains in these non-geometric backgrounds, and then I'll conclude by looking at the case of M waves in what are called non-geometric Kaluza-Klein monopole backgrounds. Okay, we'll see how time goes. This is a lot of material uh, potentially to get through, but I hope to get to the end because I think the, the end will tie together a lot of what I said at the beginning. So it's going to really unite this, this picture of charges um, and magnetic uh, monopole backgrounds with uh, these ideas from string theory. So at the bottom of this slide, I put I put some archive reference numbers. So as I said, I've been working on this subject since, for about eight years now. Um, I've written several review and uh, and their lecture notes on the internet. So these first two archive numbers are are very general physics type reviews um, geared at the level that I'm going to try to give in these lectures. So if you're interested in kind of a write-up of what I'm going to say in the next uh, 90 minutes or so, then you could look at these first two articles. If you're, if you're more interested on, on, on how, how this picture fits in with strings and M theory, um, this, this other article here um, is, uh, is, is more relevant. It focuses more on, on the applications to string theory. And finally, if you're, you're more mathematically oriented and you'd like to understand or learn a bit more about the, the, the kind of higher mathematics that's involved in what I'm going to say, there's this article here that I wrote, um, I wrote last year, uh, which really focuses less on the physics, but more on the technical mathematical aspects. Okay. And I'm going to just touch a bit on some of the, the interesting mathematics um, that comes from uh, these physics considerations, um, but I won't go into them a lot. There's a lot of kind of abstract mathematics. And indeed, this is one of the, uh, again, I should say, if you're into the more mathematical end of theoretical physics, this has really been a, a very fruitful um, starting point for discussions with mathem mathematicians, particularly people working in higher geometry, because a lot of these ideas require um, generalizations of notions of geometry. Um, so there, there is a lot of mathematical interest in what I'm going to talk about, um, but I'm not going to uh, review that. So that's the outline. So let's start off with some historical things. Um, so the history of non-associativity in, in quantum mechanics, as I, as I said a few minutes ago, uh, can really be traced back to the, the pioneering days of quantum mechanics, the late 20s, early 30s. Um, and, and as far as I know, the first, the first idea of non-associativity goes back to Jordan. Okay. Now, what Jordan was interested in doing is he was trying to give an algebraic construction of observables in quantum mechanics. Okay, so we know what are observables in quantum mechanics? Well, we think of them as, as Hermitian operators, okay, things that have real eigenvalues. Um, and the, the, the subtle thing about Hermitian operators is that they don't close to an algebra in any obvious way. If you have a pair of Hermitian operators, then in general, the product of those operators is not Hermitian. It's not Hermitian unless the two operators commute with each other. And likewise, if we look at the commutator of two uh, Hermitian operators, that's also not a Hermitian operator, because if you take its conjugate, it changes sign. So unless A and B are special examples of commuting operators, their product is never going to be Hermitian. So what Jordan wanted to do is he wanted to take the collection of Hermitian operators and turn it into the algebra. And the idea was very simple. So the product of two 
Hermitian operators is not Hermitian, but this combination here, this A circle B, is Hermitian. This is the symmetrized product of the two operators, and that is Hermitian if A and B are Hermitian, even if they don't commute. Okay. Now, this pro this operation here has has a special properties. First of all, it's a commutative operation. That's obvious from the formula if you interchange A and B, um, but it's a non-associative operation. You can check that in general if you take a triple of, uh, of symbols A, B, and C, then they will not associate under this relationship. Okay? There are special, special combinations that associate. For instance, this combination, if you take A squared uh, and multiply by B, then A, that's the same thing as, as first multiplying B with A and A squared. So this combination associates, but in general, they don't associate. So you can axiomatize this and you can say you could call this structure a Jordan algebra. Okay, so this is what people often refer to as a Jordan algebra. And this condition here um, it, it can be called something that's known as the alternative condition or rather more precisely it's equivalent to the alternativity condition. So, okay. Okay. And so, so that's uh, that would be a Jordan algebra with those properties. It, it's it's commutative, um, and it has ha, it has a little bit of associativity present, but in general, it's it's non-associative. And in, in general, in a more abstract setting, if if you have a a commutative non-associative algebra satisfying this condition, and it can always be brought or or it's isomorphic to an algebra of operators on some, on some vector space with this project, then you call that a special Jordan algebra. Okay, so special Jordan algebras are the things that are construct, whose underlying roots come from looking at just uh, products of associative operators and then defining this modified or symmetrized product. Okay. Now, it was realized later that, that there's, there's more structure here. So, you don't, rather than demanding this relation, we can just demand what's known as this alternative condition. So, again, it's a, a kind of a, a little bit of, of associativity um, is maintained in here. And you could have, could drop the commutativity restriction as well. Okay, so we can speak about a non commutative. Jordan algebra, and uh, so in mathematics, this has been a, a, been, a, been a subject that people have worked on for, for many years now, the topic of Jordan algebras, where you still have some control over the non-associativity in these theories. So this is what Jordan, Jordan's goal was. He wanted to find, uh, build up a theory of non-special Jordan algebra. So you want non-special Jordan algebras because you don't want to refer back to the original uh, multiplication of operators acting on a space. So this was the program of Jordanian quantum mechanics, but the program failed. The program failed uh, because of a famous theorem shortly after this idea was introduced, the Jordan von Neumann Wigner theorem, um, which worked with finite dimensional Jordan algebras, and they showed that 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 um, they class what this paper did is it classified the finite dimensional Jordan algebras and showed that there was only one class of Jordan algebras which are non-special, right? Which are non-isomorphic to these types of algebras that we use to motivate the definition. Okay. And that, so that was in the finite dimensional case. And then many years later, 50 years later, uh, Zelmanoff generalized this to the infinite dimensional case. So for all intents and purposes, there are no, uh, there are no examples of non-special um, infinite dimensional Jordan algebras. And so there's no, there are no nice Jordan algebras that can be used to build up Jordanian quantum mechanics. There was this one example here, the three by three Hermitian matrices where the entries are, are octonions. I'm gonna say a bit more about the octonions in a moment. And that was developed in the, in the 70s. It was shown that, that there's a, a version of quantum mechanics called octonionic quantum mechanics uh, that's perfectly well-defined. It's in the sense that it satisfies the von Neumann 
axioms for a quantum theory, despite the fact that such a theory has no Hilbert space formalism, right? So this is a key thing I'm going to talk about a lot, is that once you relax the condition of associativity, you cannot represent these elements of a non-associative algebra as operators on a Hilbert space, because by definition, operators on a Hilbert space associate. Okay? There's no way around it. Okay, so despite the fact that, that, that such a theory had no Hilbert space formulation, it still seemed to be consistent. And indeed, the, the, I'm going to argue in this, in this lecture that the, the examples that I'm going to look at of, of non-associative quantum mechanics are perfectly well-defined, they're interesting, they're, they're physically sensible, uh, and these are interesting things that we should be looking at. Okay, so that's that's going back to the roots. Let me talk a little bit now about the octonions. Okay, and uh, and this is of course something I'm always asked when the, the people see the word non-associative. They say, "Oh, you mean the octonions?" And well, yes, okay, the octonions are an example of a non-associative algebra, but uh, but they're not the only example. I mean, this would be like saying, you know, the only example of a non-commutative algebra are the quaternions, right? And of course, we know that's not true. But the octonions are an interesting example, and they're going to be particularly relevant to what I'm going to say later on. Okay, so the the octonions, as you know, so here's the, the this this slides a bit of math here. We're going to do a bit of math for a few minutes. So you, octonions appear in a, in a chain along with the real numbers, the complex numbers, and the quaternions. Okay, so um, these are these are the four. Um, ex, these are the only four um, examples of what are called normed division algebras over the field of real numbers. Okay, so the octonions fit in this chain, and there's an embedding. So we know that R can be embedded into the complex numbers. The complex numbers embed into the quaternions, and likewise the quaternions embed into the octonions. So how do we how do we describe the octonions? Well, the you know like the the complex numbers are are, are generated by um, by a, an a unit element called one in an imaginary unit. The quaternions, you generalize this to get three imaginary units. The octonions now have these seven imaginary units, these E's I have there. And uh, the, the multi, you can write down the multiplication rule in general. Um, one, one nice way to, to think about it is, is through this Fano plane mnemonic. So you place these imaginary units at the nodes of this diagram here. And when you multiply, you follow the arrows, right? So for instance, if I want to multiply E7 with E1, I follow the arrow from E7 to E1, and then down again, that gives me E5. Okay. If I want to go in the other direction, I just insert minus signs. So I show, that's what I showed here, for instance. So I did the E1 to E5 gives E7. If I go against the arrows, I get a minus, okay? They all square to minus one. That's why they're imaginary units. And in general, you can write their product um, in this form for some three index tensor. So this is a, a three index tensor, which I'm not gonna write out. Um, it has, it's the kind of octonionic analog of what, of the um, levi chavita symbol you would write for the quaternion algebra. Uh, this has seven non-vanishing entries. Um, and it's not in very, so this, this is generated by these, these seven imaginary octonions, but this is not invariant under the full group of seven dimensional rotations, SO7. Rather, it's only invariant under the exceptional group G2. Right, and um, in a suitable basis, you can actually, if you rewrite the six of the, uh, the three of these elements in terms of F, you can write down the commutation relations of the octonions like this. Okay, so I'm writing this down because I'm going to come back to this later on. And the the commutation relation you see that's written in green here. And these are these are the EIs where I runs from one, two, and three. These are just the commutation relations of the octonion algebra. Okay, so the octonions are contained in this algebra. Now, this is this is a non-associative algebra, and in fact, it's an example of a non-commutative Jordan algebra in the sense that it satisfies this alternativity 
condition. It's non-associative, but there's a little bit of associativity left there. And the associate non-associativity is controlled by a Jacobiator. Okay, so it's a it's a it's a three bracket, and the three bracket is just defined as the combination of iterated two brackets you would get that you would write down to say that the Jacobi identity was satisfied. So this quantity would be the combination of, of embedded um, two brackets that would be zero if the Jacobi identity were satisfied. Now here it's not zero um, and it satisfies this type of relation. Again, there's some other four index tensor eta floating around, which also has only seven non-zero values. I'm not going to write out what that is. Um, and the fact that the uh, Jacobiator, uh, the fact that the algebra is alternative implies that the Jacobiator is the same as the associator, right? This quantity on the, on the right is the associator, okay? It's the thing that should be zero if the algebra is associative. Okay. That's a bit of math there. These are the octonions, and uh, we'll we'll try to come back to this near the end of the talk. But this is really the very basic example of a non-associative algebra. Okay. Now, just to go back to a bit of history, um, the idea of of non-associativity in quantum mechanics. Um, came about in a somewhat different way back in the 70s, um, through early work of Nambu. Okay. So, so Nambu introduced this notion of Nambu mechanics. Um, th this was a notion of, of, of mechanics that was motivated actually to look at uh, mechanical systems that were non-integrable. And the hope was that by doing this, we could find a new notion of integrability and, being a and be able to completely solve these systems. So Nambu mechanics is, is, is a theory which is based on generalizing Hamiltonian mechanics to bi-Hamiltonian mechanics. So it's, it's good, a theory now whose time evolution is governed by two Hamiltonians instead of just one. And, and the underlying object is, is something known as a Nambu Poisson bracket. Um, so then the, the example that Nambu originally looked at, this was um, on the space R3, and the three bracket is just defined by this equation here. Okay, so this is you know, this is just a natural generalization of uh, of what you would write for the Poisson bracket on R2, right? On just two-dimensional flat space. So this bracket is required to satisfy the Leibniz rule. It satisfies the Leibniz rule in each of its slots because of the derivatives that appear in its definition definition, and it satisfies a kind of higher version of the Jacobi identity, which is called the fundamental identity. So this is a, a notion of the Jacobi identity for this three bracket. And you can actually abstract, abstract um, this structure, the, the, the anti-symmetry of this three bracket with the fundamental identity into a higher notion of a Lie algebra that's called the three Lie algebra. So that was realized much later uh, than Nambu, but three Lie algebras have come also to play a prominent role um, in, uh, in string theory and M theory, um, and they are also connected in this way to uh, non-associativity. So the example Nambu looked at is he looked at the Euler equations, which govern Poxa vida. Ele vai perceber que caiu. Eu vou escrever aqui no bate-papo.
just continue okay yeah i don't know what happened but uh, i don't seem to have control of the slides anymore well we are seeing your le your last slides i mean yeah but i can't change. i can't I, I mean i can't move them i i don't have control anymore so, i see so you you have to to go out and and get in again can you do that what do you want me to do you want me to exit or yes exit your your these slides i mean exit the slides uh, how do yes. i do that uh, let me see here just close close presentation yes close okay okay it's closed and now now you upload again now i upload so i hit this arrow upload there's something there that says current can i just use that or uh, yes yes or... you can use that okay. no problem uh, nothing's happening is it uploading or yeah you use your current uh, presentation okay but it hasn't i don't see it
Okay. So that, that was the break. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was, that was break. <laughs> so it wasn't planned, but that's the break. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so I was here, I think. Yeah. Okay. Well, yes. welcome back, everybody. Um, so let, let's see. i got to get back into my train of thought. So, so what Mambu showed was, um, was that the Euler equations can be written in terms of this by Hamiltonian form. That was the working, working example of what uh, Mambu showed. Okay? Now, you can ask about the quantization now. Okay, so this is classical mechanics. What about, what about quantization? So how, is, uh, how do we quantize this? Um, so if this was a Poisson bracket, you would, you know, you would say, well, we'll turn our, 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 you know, our, our degrees of freedom into operators and we'll replace the Poisson bracket with a commutator bracket, the commutator of operators acting on a Hilbert space. Um, the analog of the commutator would be the Jacobiator, right? The thing that, you know, this three bracket we talked about before, and that's just not going to work in this case because the Jacobiator on operators is always going to be zero. So what Nambu suggested was instead of using the full Jacobiator, we use this, this combination here that he called a half Jacobiator. So this is sort of, these three terms are half of what you would write down uh, for the full Jacobiator, which is equal to zero. Um, this turns out not to be such a nice thing to work with. Um, in particular, it, it, it's difficult, doesn't give us really a satisfactory uh, quantization. So, in fact, Nambu later suggested um, that one should use non-associative algebras to quantize his three bracket, this Nambu Poisson bracket up here, through a Jacobiator. And that you can do provided that these symbols that you map your functions to sit inside a non-associative algebra. So, the whole idea of quantizing Nambu mechanics is also related to this older problem started by Jordan and others of formulating non-associative quantum mechanics. So that's some background history. And now I want to kind of quickly, quickly go because, um, because we seem to have lost uh, time with this technical things, but let me just give a snapshot here of, of, of how non-associativity has appeared since the, the 80s and throughout the 90s in string theory and end theory. So back in the 80s, it was realized in the context of closed string field theory that there are non-associativity anomalies. So there are commutator brackets which don't satisfy the Jacobi identity. Now, this was discovered to be an off-shell phenomenon that goes away when you put the theory on-shell, okay? So the theory can still make sense despite the fact that you have these non-associative anomalies. And, of course, this understanding what these, these non-associativity relations mean led ultimately to the realization that L-infinity algebras underlie the structure of closed string field theory. So that's his famous work by Barton Zwieback back in, uh, in 93, um, which was subsequently connected to the notion of a, a strong homotopy Lie algebra, um, which is, which is I'm not going to discuss in these lectures, but is, but is a somehow, in some sense, a very natural place for non-associativity to occur, because these types of algebras do not um, have associativity relations. Rather, they have what are called um, homotopy associativity relations where not where associativity is violated but in a very controlled way. Now the spark of interest in, in non-commutative geometry in physics came about as, as, as some of you will know in the late 90s when it was realized that in the physics of d-brains in string theory if d-brains are subjected to a constant um, background two-form field, which is called the B field, and which you can think of as, as really a magnetic field, um, then, then the, the, the effective dynamics on the D-brain um, can be described in a deformed way that's related to non-commutative field theory. And so so D-brains in these background um, B fields are examples of non-commutative geometries. 
Now, if we take the B field and we make it non-constant, so the B field's a two form. So if I look at its curvature, which is a three form, and that's not zero, then th this gives us, it still, it gives us a structure, but this is a non-associative structure now. So this, the curvature of your B field controls the Jacobi identity. And this was realized around the same time that the D brains and curved backgrounds give examples of non-associative geometries. Okay. Um, and again, it really appears as an off-shell effect. When you put the when you put the the open string dynamics on shell, all of the contributions from non-associativity go away. Then there was subsequent work in the mathematics literature um, looking at t-duality. So t-duality was realized in uh, the mid-2000s to lead to examples of non-associative geometries of the type that I'm going to talk about uh, later on. And now if we lift this to M-theory, also M-theory provides a natural a physical arena uh, where non-associativity structures arise, but in a slightly different way. Okay, there's the famous Bagger-Lambert theory of multiple M2 brains, which was developed last uh, in the last decade, where it was where it was argued that that the underlying gauge structure uh, for a system of multiple M2 brains should be governed by some entity that's described by a three algebra. So I mentioned this word three Lie algebra before, that was the original uh, proposal, but it was realized later that that should maybe be relaxed to other notions of three algebras. So, and as I, as I argued already, three algebras are related to non-associativity. So in this sense, these multiple M2 brains are also giving physical realizations of three algebras. And now the lift of the D brain picture I talked about up here was also extended. So you, you lift the, the two form B field now lifts to a three form uh, C field um, and your D brains become M2 brains. So now the, op sorry, the strings become M2 brains. So the, the, instead of open strings, we look at now open M2 brains in these three form backgrounds. And these are related now to the quantization of these Nambu Poisson three brackets. So these are some, some again, some work, again, all around the, the started around this time in the late 90s, early 2000s, um, where in M theory, it was realized that, again, there's a really the string generali the generalization to M theory of the well-known D brain picture involves non-associative algebras. There are G2 and spin, spin seven geometries that, that feature as backgrounds of M theory. Um, and uh, again, insofar as G2, um, the symmetry group G2 is the automorphism group of the octonions. This is also naturally um, encoding non-associativity in the geometric level in M theory. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about all of these things. In this lecture, what I want to focus on are two related and very special occurrences. I want to look at first the physics of magnetic monopoles. Um, and, and probably for time constraints, I'm really going to spend most of my time on, uh, on this example because it's a very simple example that I think, uh, I'm not sure who, you know, who's in the audience, but um, it, it's something that a very general audience will understand. Um, and if there's time, uh, or maybe in the in the question session, I'll 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 try to get through as much as possible talking about how um, how these ideas fit into a more modern context of uh, of non-geometric string theory and M theory backgrounds. Okay, but I really want to spend a lot of time this very simple model of magnetic monopoles, which dates back to the mid '80s. Um, these ideas date back to the mid 80s because um, also in addition to these, these commutator anomalies that I talked about in string field theory, it was also noticed that in certain chiral gauge theories coupled to fermions also suffer from several, uh, similar non-associative anomalies. Okay, so that was the motivation back then and, and, and this the modern motivation for studying the magnetic monopole problem is that it's a toy model for these string theory and M theory settings. 
Okay, so let's go and, and, and start. That was um, a brief history, which was not so brief, um, but let's move on. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce first, um, I'm going to just give a definition of something I call magnetic Poisson brackets, uh, and then I'm going to go through and talk about why we're interested in these things. So we look at very, very simple. So we've got a D-dimensional configuration space, just RD. Um, and of course, it has a dual space, which I think of as a space of momenta. And the phase space, you can think of formally as the cotangent bundle of this configuration space, but it's just a copy of M with its dual. I'll denote coordinates on phase space by these capital letters X with capital indices and position and momentum coordinates by these smaller case letters with small indices. And on phase space, there is a canonical symplectic two form um, that we all know. And now what I do is I introduce a two form, a two form on configuration space that I call B. Okay, and B is going to play the role of a magnetic field eventually. So I'm going to refer to this as the magnetic field two form. And now you can take the canonical symplectic structure and shift it, shift it by B. Okay, it gives you another two form. The two form is non degenerate, but it's not necessarily closed anymore. Okay, in fact, it's closed if and only if the two form B is closed. Okay, so it's something called an almost symplectic form, which means it's non-degenerate, but it's not necessarily closed. Okay. And so if you invert this, you get a bivector, and that bivector defines a set of brackets that I'm going to call magnetic Poisson brackets. So the, for functions on phase space, F and G, um, it gives us a bracket by this formula. And uh, on the, at the level of the coordinate functions, the, the, the fundamental brackets look like this. Okay, so the two x's commute. You have the canonical commutation relation between the positions and momenta. But now the momenta no longer commute. Okay, so momentum space has become non-commutative, and its non-commutativity is controlled now by this two form. Okay. And in fact, depending on B, um, in general, this is a, a non-associative algebra. Okay. So if, as I said up here, this two form is closed if and only if B is closed. So DB is zero. So we can take B, it's a two form. We can define a three form, which I might want to refer to as the magnetic charge, because that's what it's going to be in examples. Okay. Um, and this three form controls the vanishing of the Schouten bracket of this um, bivector theta b. Okay, if you don't know what the Schouten bracket is of a bivector, uh, don't worry. I'm, I'm not going to write it down. But but the but the vanishing of the Schouten bracket of a bivector that you can use to define these brackets is equivalent to the Jacobi identity for those brackets. So. This H, in general, controls a non-associative algebra. Okay, so there's a, the, there are Jacobiators that are non-vanishing, and in this case, the only non-vanishing coordinate functions whose Jacobiators non-zero are when you put a triple of momenta in. Okay? And this is sort of obvious from these relations, right? Right, because if I if I calculate the commutator of two momenta, I get a B. And because X and P are canonical variables, when I take another commutator with P, it acts as a derivative. Okay, so when you do the full combination of, uh, of identities required for the Jacobi identity, you're just going to get this three form. Okay, that's a very, very elementary example of a non associative algebra. So let's look at some examples of this. And the simplest example of this is in the physics of magnetic monopoles. So we look at three dimensions. We put D equal to three. And this, what is this two form now? This two form is determined by a magnetic field, magnetic field in three dimensions. So using this Levi Chavita symbol, we can turn the magnetic field in three dimensions into a two form. Uh, but, but now, now I just want to think of this, this vector, this, vec uh, this magnetic field vector. 
Okay, and E here is an electric charge, so these plus all these these brackets I wrote down are governing the motion of an electric charge in a magnetic field. I'm going to assume the magnetic field is static, so it doesn't evolve in time. And then it depends on what the the nature of these brackets and and the theory that we're discussing depends very much on the nature of the magnetic field. If the field magnetic field is closed, okay, so the, the this this three form H I wrote down is zero. This is just the classical Maxwell theory. Okay? The classical Maxwell theory, because dB equals zero in this case is just equivalent to saying that the divergence of the, max, the magnetic field is zero. Okay, this is of course one of the one of the Maxwell equations. And on R3, this means that B can be represented as the curl of a vector potential. Okay, there's a globally defined vector potential for my field. Okay, so that's the simplest case of, of, of Maxwell theory. Let's modify that a bit. So let's say that, that the divergence of B is not zero, but, it, but it's very mildly non-zero. So it's, a just, it's only non-zero at the origin. So I give it this... Um, and this delta function dependence, then, uh, well, well, we know what this is. This is De Dirac's modification of, of Maxwell theory. It's the Dirac monopole. This equation can be solved by the Dirac monopole uh, magnetic field, which looks like this. So G is the, the monopole, magnetic monopole strength. Of course, this is singular at the origin where the monopole lives, and everywhere away from the origin, it could be represented as locally as the curl of, uh, again, a vector potential, which has a formula that looks like this, okay? So this, this vector potential here has a larger set of singularities. This is parametrized by a fixed unit vector that I call n in this formula. So whenever x lies on the straight line in the direction of this unit vector n, the denominator here is zero, and that gives a singularity. Okay, and this singularity, this line of singularities, is of course just the famous Dirac string singularity. But that's the next simplest case. Okay, um, and, and Dirac monopoles were 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 of particular interest um, around ten years ago because there were some uh, some special. Uh, uh, types of lattices um, in condensed matter physics that were found to give condensed matter analogs of magnetic monopoles. So there was quite some work in, in, in kind of detecting condensed matter analogs of, uh, of Dirac monopoles by uh, scattering neutrons off of, uh, of types of lattices that have these kind of tetrahedral structures. The atoms are arranged in these tetrahedra that I've uh, indicated here, um, and I don't want to say too much about this. I just want to say that that you know there has been uh, suggestions that non-associativity might be something we can really see in the lab, um, and it's very much uh, connected to uh, whether or not we can observe really magnetic charge and magnetic monopoles uh, in in real physical scenarios. Okay. And so this was the case of where you have really a singular source of, uh, of magnetic charge. And more generally, we can ask what happens when we have a smooth distribution. So if we have some smooth distribution, it's not just a delta function supported at the origin, but it's really some smooth uh, function um, on, on our space, then this will give us a smooth distribution of magnetic charge. So the ultimate goal is to try to understand how to work with these. Okay. Now, in string theory, I just want to quickly explain um, how these are interest in string theory. Well, we could take those brackets that I wrote down a couple of slides ago, and we can apply a canonical transformation to them. Okay. And this is something called a, a Born reciprocity map. Okay, it's a map which which essentially just in, interchanges mom, positions and momenta. Okay, it's an order four transformation. You put in minus signs so that you preserve the canonical symplectic structure. But what it does is that then takes your two form field B 
and it maps it now into a two-form on momentum. So remember, B was a two-form on configuration space, so this becomes now a two-form on momentum space, and these brackets we wrote down before now become this. So before I found that the P brackets were non-commutative, here I find that the bracket of two Xs is non-vanishing. Okay, so this is giving me some kind of a non-commutative space now, configuration space, rather than a non-commutative momentum space. Okay, so again, you can you can again look at the violation of of associativity, the violation of the Jacobi identities of these brackets, and it's it's controlled now by a three-form on momentum space, and that three-form is something that we're going to call an R flux. Okay, so this is jargon from non-geometric string theory, uh, where we now refer to the, the curvature of this two-form on momentum space as an R flux, R flux, okay? And now you see that your configuration space has become a non-associative space because the would-be Jacobiator, which should vanish, would-be Jacobi identity um, is now lost by this non-vanishing Jacobiator three bracket. Okay. And this is what's called the R-flux model. In string theory, it's called the R-flux model, and it purportedly, conjecturally describes the phase space of closed strings, which propagate in certain flux compactifications of string theory called locally non-geometric R-flux backgrounds. Okay. So I think in the interest of time, I'm going to just uh, speed up a bit and, and maybe skip a few a few things here. Um, so, the, so the, the the comments at the bottom here were just for the you know the string aficionados. Um, that the the one way to think about the R flux background is by applying T duality to a three torus which has an H flux, an H flux of the type I was talking about before. Okay, so if you I don't want to say a lot about that because I don't think I'm going to have time to. To come back to it. Let me get back down to looking at the uh, magnetic charge example. Okay, so let's go back to D equals three and let's look at the motion in this magnetic field B. Okay? So this is now a general magnetic field B. I'm going to think of this that either it has magnetic sources or it doesn't. Uh, but no matter what, the key force about the key point about looking at the dynamics of electric charge in magnetic fields is you do not need a vector potential to describe them. Okay? This is a crucial thing. Okay? The equations of motion for an electric charge in a magnetic field are governed by the Lorentz force law. Okay? The Lorentz force law is an equation for the kinematical momentum. This is not the canonical momentum. It's the kinematical momentum of your particle. Okay, and they depend only on the magnetic field B. So as usual, that these are equivalent to Ham Hamilton's equations for this magnetic Poisson bracket that I wrote down before for the usual Hamiltonian one over two m p squared. Okay, but it's, it's not really the usual Hamiltonian because this is the the the, the mechanical momentum I'm putting, and it's not the canonical momentum. So it's not really the free particle. Okay, it looks like a free particle, but it's not quite because remember the in general these momentum components do not commute. So at the classical level, we can already learn a lot by looking at what the solutions to the classical equations of motion are going to look like. Um, uh, given the nature of a magnetic field. So let's look at the simplest case. Let's look at a constant magnetic field. Okay. So you want to put B equals a constant in these equations. And you know how to solve this, all right? Now this is, again, kind of undergraduate physics. Um, you can you know, map, map the equations of motion onto the equations for a harmonic oscillator. Um, so in the in the x y in the it, it, the the trajectories look like this. It's a, these uniform helixes, right? So the direction of this helix is moving in the direction of the magnetic field, which is this fixed constant. And each each plane, per, if you cut the helix in any plane perpendicular to that helix, you get a circle. 
right? Just a circular motion that uh, a usual harmonic oscillator would obey. Okay. So this is what the motion looks like. Um, so the motion, the motion is not confined in the direction of the magnetic field, but in the directions perpendicular to the magnetic field, it is confined. It just moves in a circle. Okay. So that was the case of a constant B. Now what happens when we take B to be the Dirac monopole field? Again, you could look at what this system looks like. It looks like a system which is which is non-integrable, but but it is an integrable system because there is um, uh, there is a conserved quantity. There are three conserved quantities which are given by the components of what's called the Poincaré vector. So the Poincaré vector is defined to be the sum of the angular momentum of the particle with the angular momentum of the electromagnetic field that's produced by the electric charge and the magnetic monopole. And again, the, the conservation of the Poincaré vector now confines the motion of the charge to sit on a cone. Okay, so I've drawn the cone here. The apex of the cone, this point down here, is where the monopole sits. That's where the, the kind of singularity is. And uh, so, so again, the, the motion of the electric charge is confined on the surface of this cone, and it moves away. It always moves away from the apex of the cone of the cone. It never reaches the magnetic monopole, and, and therefore non-associativity at this level never plays any role here. Right? Because the non-associativity, remember, was sort of concentrated at the location of the monopole. It was given by this Dirac delta function distribution. And as long as we're away from the location of the monopole, you're ne the dynamics is never going to experience any non-associativity. And this is why, you know, when you learn about Dirac monopoles initially, one never normally speaks about non-associative physics. So let's look at now a situation with a constant magnetic charge. Um, so again, now it's going to depend on, on, on what you source the magnetic charge with. So what the particular profile of the magnetic field be. Okay, so in this case, um, you can say then the, the equations are integrable in this case, and now you can solve them. Um, and then you find that these, these sort of generalize the, the, the case of a constant B field here. The motion follows what's called as a, uh, an Euler spiral, again, with uniform velocity in the direction of this magnetic field. So the Euler spiral is, a, is the modification of the helix where you replace the trigonometric functions that parametrize the helix with uh, what are called Fresnel integrals. Okay, but here's a plot of what it looks like. So they're not no longer the cross sections are no longer perfect circles, uh, but it, it forms what's known as an oral Euler spiral. And finally, again, for the now for constant magnetic charge, you can put in a different. Uh, profile for the magnetic field. This is a, a rotationally symmetric one. So you could call this an axial um, profile for the magnetic field. This is an act, a rotationally symmetric one. And now the motion is no longer integrable. There are no um, integrals of motion and it's no longer confined. Okay. And it could be shown that in this case, the by some change of variables, that the equations of motion are equivalent to the equations for motion in a Dirac monopole background with additional frictional forces. So there, this is really a highly non-integrable system, and the, uh, the, the trajectories are no longer confined in any way. So the type of the, this is the classical picture, of course, and we could see um, some striking um, qualitative and quantitative differences already. Um, but what we want to think about now is quantization. Okay, how do we how do we think about first of all canonical quantization in the context of these non-geometric strings that I talked about, or or let's say more concretely in terms of these Poisson brackets that we looked at. Okay. And is there a sensible version of non-associative quantum mechanics that will do this? Okay. So I want to explain um, a bit of this, and I want to argue that there is indeed a sensible notion of quantum mechanics.
Okay. So what is quantum? What is quantization? So let's just think a bit about quantization in the context of uh, of these uh, of these magnetic Poisson brackets. Okay. Well, quantization should be some kind of a linear map that takes a phase space function, a function on phase space, um, and associates some operator to it, some operation, let's say. Okay. I don't want to restrict yet. To operators on a Hilbert space, but there's some symbols, and these symbols have to satisfy some kind of a uh, some kind of an algebra, some kind of a commutator algebra that reproduces my my brackets in the semi-classical limit, right? At order h bar. Okay. This is what quantization means. Okay. So, in particular, if we look at this at the level of coordinate functions, it means that the the maps on basic coordinate functions should satisfy these relations over here. Okay, that's quantization. Okay. Now, in this context, once we introduce a magnetic field, we start breaking symmetries. Okay, introducing background fields and any physical system will break some of its symmetries. Um, and in particular, we break translational invariants. Okay, this is this happens even in the case of a constant magnetic field. So, but what we retain is still a notion of magnetic translations. Okay, so formally, what we do is we exponentiate products of um, of, of of moment of of operators associated to uh, momenta times these translation vectors v right so these are these are these these pvs are operators which should implement translations in um in the uh configuration space coordinates okay? but remember these p's are not canonical momenta okay? these p's are not canonical momenta they're the kinematical momenta because they don't commute in general okay so that's why these are not ordinary translations but they're magnetic translations and then these should now form some type of a representation of the translation groups okay so that means that in general it won't represent the translation group precisely but it'll represent it up to something that's a projective phase that i call phi 2 here and it might not even be a projective representation as we'll see in a moment namely the these operators may not associate with each other um, in the most general case, depending on what the magnetic field is. Okay, so that's the basic setup for quantization in this story. So let's look at the simplest case where of, of Maxwell theory. Okay, so we have a closed magnetic field B, dB is zero. Okay. Then we know that B can be written as the curvature of some globally defined one form. Okay. Now here we're working on RD. Okay, so it's very simple. That one form can be thought of now as a connection on a line bundle. Okay, a trivial line bundle, but still you can think of it as a connection on a line bundle. So what I'm explaining now is a very very complicated way to quantize this system. Okay, and I'm explaining it in this way because it's a way that's going to generalize. But in this case, I can write down exactly what this quantization map was. Okay, I just uh, represent the x's as multiplication by x's, and I represent the p's, these these uh, kinematical momenta, by these covariant derivatives with respect to this vector potential a. Okay, so they act as derivatives, and this acts on the space of sections square integral sections of this trivial bundle and because it's a trivial bundle in this case it's just the same thing as the space of square integral functions on rd okay so this is how we quantize here and these magnetic translations are now represented by wilson lines okay i take this this one form and i integrate it over a straight line between uh, x minus v and x okay so if you're more geometrical this is this is formally a parallel transport in this line bundle okay, but that's how we represent those and then what you find is that these 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 wilson lines here these magnetic translation operators 
uh, form a projective representation of the translation group on this Hilbert space. Okay, so if you work, you, you calculate their product, it's not quite the same as the uh, operator corresponding to V plus W, so it's not an honest representation, but it differs by this phase here. And this phase factor defines, um, in a mathematical sense, a, a two-co-cycle in RD, uh, but it depends on X. And for a general magnetic field B, it depends on X. Uh, so that's why this is called a weak projective representation. When B is constant, you can do the integral, and you just get a simple formula that looks like this. And then it really is a projective representation of the translation group. Okay, so that's the that's basically the quantization problem solved um, in the case where db is equal to zero. Mm -hmm. Now, there's another way to think about about the quantization here um, using um, a generalization of what's called the vowel correspondence in quantum mechanics. Okay, so we we have this map now. What we want to do is we wanted to we we represented the coordinate functions on this Hilbert space. Now let's extend this to functions. So if I give me any function on phase space, I want to associate some operator on this Hilbert space H. Okay, we do this by introducing uh, something that's kind of a hybrid of a function on phase space and an operator on H, and it's called this vial map. So it's a a it's a a function. It's a, an operator on H, but it, it's also a function on phase space. It's defined on, on these wave functions by this formula here. Okay. And then the map, the, the, the vial correspondence, is defined by taking a function f to this operator here that I've written down. Okay. So these are integrals over phase space involving this operator w of x. Okay. So this is how we map functions to operators on phase space. Um, and, and, and this is just a generalization of the usual vowel correspondence of quantum mechanics. Okay. And using this, we can, if we multiply now two operators together, we can pull that back to an operator and identify define a star product on phase space functions, right? This is one way to define a star product is by just saying that the pullback of this operator product gives me an operator with a corresponding function. You can write a closed formula for any magnetic field for the star product, um, but uh, uh, for the case of B constant, that formula looks like this, when B is constant. Okay? So it looks very, very similar to the Moyal vial product on phase space, okay? If this uh, omega B was just omega zero, the canonical symplectic structure, this would just be the Moyal vowel product, okay? So I'll call this the Moyal veil star product, okay? And then uh, some of you will know this well, this is the whole uh, way of, uh, of, of thinking about canonical quantum mechanics uh, in a different way in terms of phase space quantum mechanics, okay? There's this, this algebraic formulation of the uh, canonical operator state treatment of quantum mechanics called phase space quantum mechanics, okay? And there's a dictionary here. So now your observables or states become real functions on phase space. Um, what the multiplication of operators is now provided by the star product. Um, traces of operators are replaced by integrals. Um, the states themselves, the density matrices are now given by something called the state function, which is a normalized non-negative function on phase space. And using um, the state function, we can calculate expectation values of observables through star products and uh, integration over the phase space. Okay, it's just, just a sketch of what happens in the phase space formulation of quantum mechanics. Okay, so in this nice associative case um, where the, 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 the magnetic Poisson brackets give an associative algebra, we completely, there's a complete understanding of the quantum mechanics of this system, both from the perspective of canonical quantum mechanics, where we can construct a Hilbert space 
of physical states and represent the observables as operators there. And also in the context of phase space quantum mechanics through this dictionary down here. So let's start looking at the other cases. So what happens now when I make the curvature of B non-zero? Okay. Well, as we saw, the magnetic Poisson brackets are non-associative now. And so the standard operator state formulation of canonical quantization can no longer handle this situation. I cannot find, um, take my functions on phase space now and map them into symbols that are represented as operators on some Hilbert space, because these operators would have to uh, uh, no, be non-associative, and that can't happen on any uh, Hilbert space. Okay. Now, the exception to this is the Dirac monopole. Okay. And this is why you never hear of any such problems in the case of the Dirac monopole. Okay. So remember, the Dirac monopole potential looked like this, and it was singular at the origin, at the location of the origin. And that was the only place where there was any source of non-associativity. So everywhere away from the location of the monopole, the brackets are define an associative algebra. So you can excise the origin. Instead of looking at, at, at R3, look at R3 minus the origin, okay? Then the algebra is completely associative there. We know that away from there, we can locally write the um, Dirac monopole field as the, as the curl of some vector potential, okay? And now we can quantize this. The difference from the, pre the previous example that I looked at where the, is that the configuration space now is no longer R3, okay? And, it, and, it, and it's crucial that it's no longer R3 because this space here is not a contractible space, right? Actually, this space is, is homotopic to a two-sphere. It's not some, we can't, can't take R3 and just scrunch it to a point because we've excluded the origin there, okay? So it's a non-trivial space, and in fact, this, um, this relation here is only satisfied locally. And now the quantum Hilbert space can be again taken to be the space of square integral sections of some line bundle. And this is why I, I used this language before, because now um, this, this language of, of, of geometric quantization becomes very important here. Okay, And now there's a non-trivial line bundle over M. So the point is, is now, well, I want to think of this B as the curvature of a non-trivial line bundle. But that's only possible if the curvature itself obeys some type of a quantization condition, because it has to tell you that it's a representative of the first turn class of that line bundle. And in fact, what that quantization condition turns out to be is the famous Dirac charge quantization that relates electric and magnetic charge. So provided that Dirac charge quantization holds, I can again write down a canonical quantum theory for the uh, Dirac monopole. And, and this, uh, this, you know, this goes, this is, this is not my doing, this goes back to the 70s. This was this famous Wu and Yang way of thinking about quantizing uh, motion in the uh, Dirac monopole background. Um, without the without the need of uh, of any singularities, okay? this is all globally defined, um, and one doesn't need to introduce things like Dirac strings and so on to describe the Hilbert space. And what's more, there the this this magnetic vowel correspondence that I wrote down before also still holds. Okay? So you can it's again just on this space where you excise the origin, derive an associative phase space star product in a, exactly the same way. Okay? So this is why when you've heard about the physics of motion in a, a, a Dirac monopole background, nobody ever told you this was a problem in non-associative dynamics. Because once you have all these ingredients satisfied, you never need to think about non-associativity. But for generic smooth distribution, so if I look at things that are more general, and now I look at um, smooth distributions of magnetic charge, standard canonical quantization breaks down, no matter what. There's no way out of it. There's no analog of 
Dirac charge quantization that you can impose for a continuous distribution, let alone smooth distribution of magnetic charge. So there is simply no Hilbert space formulation. Okay. And there are ways of now, by now there's been, a, a, as I said a, at the start of my, my, my talk, that there's been by now been a lot of literature about non-associative quantum mechanics and how to deal with it. Um, one of them using uh, ideas from non-commutative Jordan algebras has been developed by uh, Boyewald and, and his collaborators. Um, and then there are some nice nice physics papers by Boyewald on, on this topic. Uh, one just came out yesterday, in fact, um, about really trying to, to argue that there are observable consequences of, of non-associativity, um, and in particular, of observing magnetic charge possible. So well, let's move on. So I want to look at this case now. I want to look at the case where I have smooth distributions of magnetic charge, and I, I can no longer develop a standard Hilbert space picture of quantum mechanics. Okay. So what am I left with? And this is why I made a big deal about the star products. Okay. And 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 doing the phase space formulation of quantum mechanics. Okay. The Canonical formulation of quantum mechanics is not available, but the algebraic description in terms of phase space quantization is available. Okay. And this is because these, these, these types of brackets um, can still be subjected to the usual machinery of deformation quantization. In particular, the famous Konsevich formality theorem, which tells us how to quantize any Poisson manifold, also applies in this case. It applies to any type of, uh, of magnetic field two form, B, that I may want to insert. Okay, um, so, so I won't say much about, about what these symbols mean here because, uh, because uh, time is moving on. Um, but there is a prescription, a well-defined construction um, uh, by Konsevich of the, defining both a, a star product that in the true sense of deformation quantization is uh, reduces in the semi-classical limit to the, 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 the brackets, the magnetic Poisson brackets that we defined earlier. Um, and now there's the added feature that, that using that formalism, I can also construct the three bracket, which in the semi-classical limit reduces to the Jacobiator of this bracket here. And the, the Bs and Ts that appear here are, are Bs are bidifferential operators and Ts are tridifferential operators. Okay, so they're 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 given by explicit but complicated um, expansions in terms of types of graphs, which are called Konsevich diagrams. Um, but there's a prescription, and there's a prescription that to construct both of these expansions order by order in this Planck constant h bar. Okay, and in particular, when h is constant, and you choose this uh, kind of rotationally symmetric choice of this two form, you can write down an explicit form for this star product. Okay. Now, if you look at that, if you if you if you if you, if you took a, a mental photograph of the star product I wrote down on the previous side for um, the case of a source-free magnetic field, and the constant case, you'll see this is the same formula. Symbolically, it's the same formula, but because B is no longer a closed two form, this is a non-associative star product. Okay. So this was worked out, um, worked out eight years ago um, uh, by actually evaluating this, uh, this Konsevich expansion in the case where, where the curvature of B uh, was constant, um, and it, 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 it's, it's somewhat of an arduous calculation, um, getting to grips on all these, um, all these diagrams. Um, uh, but you, uh, if you have a good, uh, a good graduate student, you give them the calculations to do, come back after a, a few months, and then you can uh, go and, and work out um, a closed formula for the star product. And this formula has by now been understood uh, from several different perspectives, not just the Konsevich expansion. I think I'm losing connection here. No, okay. 
Okay, so, so that's the start product. So deformation quantization is available. So we still have this kind of face space approach to canonical quantization, uh, to quantization of the dynamics in the in the monopole background available to us. And, and now in this language, we can now go and represent these, these magnetic translation operators. So these are now non-associative operators. Um, and again, you can work out explicitly, in the case where H is constant, formulas for the various phase factors that appear here. Okay? The, these operators no longer associate. And the, the um, lack of associativity is controlled by this phase factor omega here which is formally a three co-cycle of the group of translations. Okay, so it gives us a kind of what we could call as a higher projective representation uh, of the translation group on here. Okay. So that formally solves the problem. And, and in fact, you can go on and you can just go and, and develop the whole phase space formulation of non-associative quantum mechanics in this way okay i did that i did that several years ago we wrote a paper we we, we tested all kinds of things we showed that it was a, a sensible theory sensible meaning physically sensible it's mathematically it's sensible it's clear um, because the, the deformation quantization program is clear but it's a physically sensible it gives physically sensible results and it also gives novel quantitative predictions. Okay, so I'll just give you an example of, of one of the predictions it gives. So let, it, let, let's go back to this R flux model we had for a minute. Okay, remember this is where I interchanged the roles of position and momenta. Okay, so the non-associativity now is taking place in position space. Okay, and you might ask, okay, there's a, a non-associative relation in, among three position coordinates. Does this, does this lead to any type of physical consequence? And the answer is yes. Because now, in this theory, you can calculate the, um, you can calculate the um, expectation values of a triple of uncertainties. So you define uncertainties in your coordinates in the usual way. Um, you take the you take their their three bracket using using the the formulas from deformation quantization up here, calculate the expectation value according to the usual uh, prescription of uh, a phase space um, a phase space quantum mechanics, and you find that regardless of what state you're in, you always get a a, a volume uncertainty. There's a quantum of volume in this background. Okay. So in string theory, th this is one way of thinking about why these models are called non-geometric, because there's no, no localized notion of point inside these spaces. OK, and uh, there's some other words there written, but I don't want to say too much more about that. I think I'm going to skip this slide. I was going to give some more details on the quantum mechanics, but I think I'll skip that. Um, in the interest of time. And uh, right, so let's let's just say, a, I just wanna say a couple of words is, um, um, so I made a big deal that, that there is a well-defined um, physical theory underlying non-associative quantum mechanics um, and that it, it can be reproduced using the um, uh, the usual techniques of phase space quantization okay now you might ask is is, is a Hilbert fo space formulation completely lost is there no way to think of this system um, in terms of operators acting on some separable Hilbert space okay and so this is this is something I've been I've been thinking about for several several years now um, and and just to mention a couple of approaches um, one approach to this problem um, could be through uh, a, a technique called symplectic embedding okay where where you take the you take the these magnetic Poisson 
brackets and you embed them into a, a kind of higher algebra. So you, you take your face space coordinates x and p and you double them up, introduce new degrees of freedom x tilde and p tilde, and you write some extended algebra of this form. Okay? Now the key feature of the algebra that I've written here is this is an associative algebra. Okay, so by introducing these auxiliary coordinates, x tilde and t tilde, and p tilde, we can embed our original non-associative algebra into a bigger associative algebra. Okay, of course, the embedding is as a vector space, not as an algebra. And now, now okay, so you, this, is, this is now an associative algebra. In fact, it, it's symplectic. This, this defines uh, the inverse of a symplectic structure. And you can quantize this. You can quantize the extended phase space now um, using the usual you know, uh, Hilbert space techniques of canonical quantization. Okay? And you can see the canonical relations among coordinates up here. Okay, and that's, so that's something, something certainly um, you can do. You can even write down a, a Hamiltonian in the extended variables, um, which reproduces the Lorentz force law for the physical uh, degrees of freedom, the untilded coordinates. Okay, that's certainly possible. So classically, again, we can reproduce it. But the issue with this model is, is in the meaning of, of trying to eliminate these, um, these auxiliary coordinates, x tilde and p tilde. Okay? There's no, doesn't seem to be any consistent notion of Hamiltonian reduction that can eliminate those coordinates unless you're back in the associative case, in which case this is just a redundant uh, description anyway. Okay. So by consistent, I mean that, that, that you should be able to find um, some first or second class constraint and then pr you know, produce do usual Hamiltonian reduction to reduce to the original uh, magnetic Poisson algebra. Okay. So there's no polarization of this algebra that's consistent with both the Lorentz force law, <clears throat> which we were able to derive here, and the non-associativity of the magnetic Poisson algebra. So this is the, the kind of pitfall of this, and that's of course also a, a, a problem in the quantum theory. And now, now for the, the mathematical uh, aficionados, the people interested in the mathematics, there's a very interesting um, story here about higher structures, because uh, so there's no, there's no usual notion of a Hilbert space available, but there is a higher notion of something called a two Hilbert space available. And I, I don't want to go into it a lot here. I think it's, 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 it, this is a bit too advanced for the level I was going to uh, discuss here. But remember before, in the associative case, there was always an underlying line bundle. And I said, formally, we could think of the wave functions as being sections of that line bundle. Okay? Now, we don't have a line bundle here anymore because the, the, the curvature of this magnetic field is no longer zero, but we do have a higher object that's something called a gerb. Okay, so if you know what a gerb is, fine. Um, if you don't know what it is, um, just, uh, just forget it. Um, okay, um, but, but there we can again construct a, a kind of space. It's a notion of a, a higher space that's called a two Hilbert space um, and, 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 and represent these magnetic translation operators in terms of higher projective representations on this higher notion of a Hilbert space. Okay, so I just wanted to mention that, that there is some notion of, of kind of higher quantization here. Um, and I think that's a very interesting mathematical a problem to look at, uh, and, all, and more importantly, to understand how the, the mathematical technology can be used to say something about physics. Okay. And then finally, um, what's related to this approach on uh, higher structures um, is, is, is a, again, a well-known mathematical technique of transgression. So this, the, this thing I call the gerb that I was alluding to there can also can actually be mapped to a line bundle on the loop space of your manifold M. Okay, so this is just a set of loops into the manifold M. 
Okay, so this is a map called transgression. And so on the loop space, I can now go and quantize the system um, using the usual techniques of geometric quantization, um, an analogy to what we did before. Okay. Of course, the, the pitfall here is we have to work with this infinite dimensional uh, functional space of loops on the manifold. But that's another, another way of thinking about the uh, quantization um, of these systems. And uh, let me just move on. I'm not going to get through all my slides. Um, but let me go on and maybe just let me just make a few comments um, here. OK. So I, I, I said very sketchily how um, um, what, what these uh, magnetic monopole models have to do with uh, strength theory. So we're going back to the R flux model now, and I'm asking, you know, what is what? How do how do close? How does a closed string theory see non-associativity? Okay. So what we do the following: we're going to define something called tri products, a new ternary operation called a tri product. Okay. So what we do is we take the the star product that I wrote down before. Okay, but now, now it's in this R flux model, right? So it's the theory where X and P are interchanged, X and P are swapped. Okay, so I take a, a triple of functions on configuration space. So these are not phase space functions, they're on configuration space. I give them a particular ordering that I define like this, and I multiply them together using the phase space star product. So that's what this star R is. Okay, now that gives me. A function, this triple of functions with the star product, depends on P. Okay? It will depend on P even if F, G, and H don't. Okay? Because the star product itself depends on P. Okay? But I do that operation in this order, and after I've done it, I put P equals zero. So I get back another function on phase space, on a configuration space. So this gives me a ternary operation on configuration space functions that I call a tri product. And again, you can represent it as a Fourier integral of this form. Okay. So again, it's, it's, it's like a modification of the, of the usual, um, it's like the usual Fourier convolution representation of the moyal bale product, except that you take a triple of functions here and uh, the, the phase factor appearing here is this, this ternary operation determined by this flux. Okay, and what is the significance of this? Well, well, what this quantity does is it quantizes uh, another type of bracket, a ternary bracket. It quantizes this type of a three bracket, okay, where the three index tensor now is R I J K. And if this was taking place in three dimensions, this would just be the Nambu bracket. This would be a quantization of the Nambu bracket that I wrote down before, okay, when, when this R is constant. Okay, now th this, so this is, this is the way that, that, that we identified these tri-products. This was actually discovered uh, a long, many years ago now, almost, almost 30 years ago by Taktajan. Okay, so Taktajan went and looked at the problem of quantizing uh, Nambu brackets, and he suggested this type of a tri-product, okay? Now, it reappears here, it's kind of rediscovered um, in this context by thinking of these phase-space star products uh, in this constant R-flux model, okay? And then I just wrote some, wrote some comments again at the bottom here about the, um, the string theory um, interpretation. These tri-products can also be derived from a physical perspective, physics meaning that, that you can look at um, a tachyon vertex operators in closed string theory um, and, and, and derive this from uh, looking at their, their scattering. Okay. And the, the, the main thing I want to highlight is this last relation, is that this, these tri-products satisfy a property that if you integrate them, you put them under the integral sign, the deformation products just go away. <coughs> Okay, the, the, um, there's no deformation here anymore, okay? And that means in this language of, of conformal field theory and string theory that 
um, the theory is always associative on shell. Okay, so on non associativity is really uh, an off shell uh, phenomenon in this theory. Okay? But there are many interesting things that follow from these um, non associative face a star product, and they all seem to be consistent and well-defined from a physical perspective. Okay, you've got this nice mathematical tool to handle non-associativity, and at the same time, it makes perfect physical sense. Okay, so maybe just say, I think this will just, I'll keep this as my last slide, and, uh, uh, and then I'll take questions. So I didn't get through everything but uh i think it's better if we we have some uh some questions okay now i i talked about closed strings um and we might want to ask um in this model what is the low energy limit of this of this type of a closed string theory right so so in in ordinary string theory we know what the answer to that is so the low energy uh, uh target space uh, dynamics of string theory is, is gravity, or, or more, pro or, or in super string theory, it's super gravity. Okay, so in this non-associative world, uh, we might ask if this is really uh, what closed strings are seeing. Is there some non-associative version of gravity um, that we should be looking for? Okay, so this is a very th this this on the one hand is a question which is not completely physically clear uh, but more importantly on the math on the mathematical side it, it it's it's very technically involved you have to do, first of all explain what you mean by non-associative gravity so you have to develop some sort of a non-associative theory of differential geometry and in particular the metric aspects the Riemannian aspects um, and that can be done remarkably this can be done and it's been done um, uh, by myself and collaborators from 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 different points of view, all with the same underlying theme, but in, but in in a series of papers. And while there are still many unclear things there, um, we can make a lot of progress with the metric formulation of non-associative gravity. And in particular, um, when we formulate that theory on phase space and then project onto configuration space, as uh, we indicated. Um, what we find that there, there, there is there's a notion of of, of a Ricci tensor. Um, there's a unique metric compatible torsion free connection on phase space. Okay, um, and when we project down to configuration space, there's a non-trivial and real valued uh, Ricci tensor in configuration space. Okay, and I'm stressing the real valued here because usually when you do non-commutative gravity using these um, twist deformation techniques, you end up with, with, uh, with, with Ricci curvatures and other tensors, which are not real valued. They're complex valued. Okay? So their they're, they're uh, they're, they're, they're physical relevance um, is not clear. But here it's real valued. And I just wrote down, because this is some long formula here, but I wrote down uh, what the, this is the, this, this, this first term here is the classical Ricci tensor. And then these terms here are the corrections, the first order corrections to the classical Ricci tensor due to non-associativity. Okay, so it's a gamma here is, is a metric compatible connection. It's the kind of non-associative version of the levi chavita connection and, and G is the corresponding metric. Mm -hmm. and, and what you would ultimately like to find is that is there some equivalent non-associative version of the closed string effective action, which captures these corrections and also has this 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 uh, this kind of OADD symmetry. Okay, this OADD symmetry, which is related to T duality, which I haven't said a lot about um, in this talk, um, but these these non geometric backgrounds are um, in some examples really a prediction or a consequence of applying T duality to simpler. Um, simpler geometric backgrounds. Okay, so you can ask, you know, just as we know that in the non commutative gauge theory on a D brain is invariant under open string T duality, you can ask, can we find an effective non associative version of the closed string gravity action um, which has that symmetry? Okay, I think I'm going to stop there because I don't. We'll have time to uh, complete the uh, 
and theory story, which is what would have would have come next. But uh, I, I think it's better I, I, I stop here and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, so thank you. Okay, that was very good. Well, um, before opening for questions, um, I would like to ask you, Professor Zabo, to, to make your presentation available for us in order to put in, in, in our website. Mm -hmm. So you can send us uh, uh, some okay. in the future. Uh, you want me right? to email it to you or? Yes, yes. That, that you, you, can, you can't download it from here? I've uploaded it to you. I, yes, I'll, I email, I'll email, I, I, I'll exactly. email it I email. I try. Yeah, I tried that, but I don't it's know okay. how to do so. <laughs> my email is is, is more. I'll, I'll send you an email. Yeah, sure, no problem. Of course, my pleasure. Yeah, so I'll open for questions. We, we have a, uh, I mean, literally a couple of questions here. The first one is from Alison Silva. Um, what is your opinion on Alain Cohn's non-commutative model of particle physics? Can the ideas of non-associativity also be applied to this model? Right, okay, so, um, so the, this is the spectral triple, kind of the spectral formulation of, uh, of the standard model, um, which has been uh, actually reinvigorated lately because uh, that there are many developments now where that's been understood how to extend this um, to Lorentzian signature, um, you know, how to incorporate neutrinos into this. Um, and 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 the the question you're asking has actually been being looked at right now. So there's a group at the Perimeter Institute in Canada um, that's looking at this. They're looking at kind of non-associative versions of um, of the spectral of spectral triples of the non-associative algebras are really these are, are, are finite finite dimensional non-associative algebras like the octonions but that's exactly what 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 one one strand of development is right now um, to look at, at look at how to modify um, this this treatment of the standard model by 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 putting in um, I'm putting in non-associative algebras, um, and they're finding uh, they're finding that this is uh, um, th this gives something sensible and seems to be solving a lot of problems with reproducing the uh, um, the particle spectrum of the of the standard model. Um, I can't I don't remember in detail exactly what they found, but um, um, but indeed there there are there is literature on this uh, on the archive now um, where people have. Thought about this, so the answer is yes. It, it's being done, as far as I know. Uh, but but as somebody who's not working directly on on that particular area, I don't think I can say much more about um, about what they found. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Ronny Amorim. In fact, he has um, two questions. The first one is uh, in the quantization of magnetic Poisson brackets. Is possible the existence of ambiguity? How do you solve this problem? In the quantization of magnetic Poisson rackets. So, um, <clears throat> well, I mean, I, I think the short answer is, is is you don't. We don't solve the problem. I mean, um, I'm not sure what. I mean, quantization always suffers from ambiguities, right? I mean, this operator state correspondence. Um, that we write down in quantum mechanics always suffers from ambiguities, right? And, and you know, and there's you yes. know, when I put when I when I put in these minimal requirements that all I want is that the semi-classical limit somehow come out of this, you know, there's even in deformation quantization, there's lots of star products that you can write down. Um, so I, I don't, I mean, I, I don't really have a satisfactory answer to that. I mean, what you know at the level of deformation quantization is that the star products are equivalent, They're equivalent in the sense of Kontsevich. Okay, so there's an invertible map between the two algebras with that star product. Um, but but I mean we know this. We know that there are, there are there are ambiguities in any in any quantum theory. Um, in this sense, quant quantization is not a well-defined uh, kind of operation. 
Uh, what we do know, of course, is that that the physics is uh, is not affected by these ambiguities because at the end of the day, the, th the things that we calculate, that we measure, um, do not depend on the ambiguities. But um, so I don't I don't know if I've answered your question satisfactorily, but I. I uh, I would say you, you you find the same ambiguities here as you do in the you know associative case, um, and at the level of deformation quantization, they're no worse than the associative case. I mean, they're there. I see. So so the observable are always the same. Well, no, I said the measurements are the same, right? I see. Right. You know. I, I mean. See. You know. The measurements. The reality so, doesn't change. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So the next question is, um, what is the advantage of working in phase space in this context? I mean, context in, in the non-associative. Well, it, because it's the only it's the only tool I have we have right now, right? Um, so. The, the way I tried to, so what I tried to, to emphasize is that if we look at the associative case, we have two different pictures. We have the picture of canonical quantization, where I represent my, my, uh, my degrees of freedom as operators on a Hilbert space. And I equivalently have this, this picture of phase space quantum mechanics. So I have these two things available, okay? What, what do I lose? When I go to the non-associative picture, I lose the Hilbert space picture. Okay, I completely lose that because there's no way to represent a non-associative product on a Hilbert space, on a conventional Hilbert space, because operators on a Hilbert space always associate. They're always associative. Okay, So of course they can be non-commutative. Non-commutativity is not a problem, but they have to associate. So in this setting, the only, only thing I have at my disposal right now where I can do calculations and I can you know, make predictions in non-associative quantization is the phase space formulation, is the is phase space quantum mechanics. And I should stress again that it's a very powerful technique, okay? Because we, we're, it's not a qualitative technique. We're able to really calculate things in it. And other people have been able to calculate things in that theory. Okay, so it's it's really a very important tool, I think, and uh, and I simply don't know how to write down a canonical picture of quantization in the non-associative case. I alluded to these things about two Hilbert spaces and higher structures, um, and and these are things that are being thought of now. But um, whether or not that's going to have anything, um, you know, to do with physics in the end, um, is we're still a long way from really understanding. Okay, uh, how about the, the importance of using the phase space in the context, context of, of non commutative physics? Because when we learn some quantum mechanics in undergraduate level, we always uh, choose a coordinate representation or, mm -hmm. or moment representation. So w when, when you talk to someone about quantum mechanics and you use phase space, they will always say, well, I can do that in some representation. So in your opinion, what's the importance of, of phase well, space in general? I mean, you know, the, the phase space formulation of quantum mechanics, of course, has has its own problems, right? Because, um, um, you know, it does, it do, you know, for, for, for complicated systems, it, it gives, um, it gives, you know, um, it doesn't give proper probability probability distributions it really only gives in general it'll only give you a quasi probability distribution so there there are some you know question marks in general about the physical interpretation of the uh, of the phase space um, uh, technique I mean with my opinion I think I mean I think for simple systems um, it's of course you know of course it's as good as re and as reliable as the um, as the uh, as the uh, canonical uh, formalism um, and uh, I mean if you ask you know real you know um, the people um, who pushed who were pushing this theory uh, 
uh, many years ago, you know, they would say, you know, quantum mechanics kind of lives and breathes in phase space, right? They say this is just a natural, natural thing to do. But um, um, I mean, I, you know, to be honest, I never, never thought about star products until I started, you know, thinking about, you know, non-commutative geometry. I mean, I think for, I think that's true for a lot of, a lot of people that they were kind of introduced to this. But um, so I, again, I, I think, I think the phase space picture does have some limitations uh, to it for more complex uh, systems. Um, the nice thing about the face space picture, as I said, is that it, it, it helps in situations like this, and the non-associative case, or, or states, or, or, or perhaps even, sit, it might even help in situations where the canonical formalism is not so convenient, where this operator state correspondence is not so easy to write down. Okay, and I have a, a, a last question for myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, in, your, in your opinion, uh, um, let, let, let me give some context. When we, we integrate uh, COVID space times uh, in any field theory, we do that usually uh, by introducing some covariant derivatives and, and so mm -hmm. on. Uh, but in the case of phase space, if we try to do that, well, in, in coordinates, we can do that, but we have a problem when doing that for momenta, because uh, we don't have a connection for momenta. Uh, so, in your opinion, how do, do, you, do, do we integrate uh, COVID spaces in, in the phase space? I mean, is that a, a four-dimension uh, uh, manifold? or a dimension or, or what's your opinion? Um, okay, I'm trying to understand the question. So you're saying you want to, you want to take a curved manifold and, uh, and, 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 and think of the phase space formulation over a, okay. Well, I mean, so, I mean, okay, you have I mean, to be do, a little- do, do, do the same thing as, as, as field theory. Uh, when, when you do, you, you usually, uh, you, you choose a representation for, for instance, coordinate representation, and integrate that to COVID space times by means uh, using mm -hmm. uh, 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 covariant derivatives and so on. So, yes. how do that in phase space? But you want a curved phase space. Well, I mean. So this work I mentioned actually on, on my last slide here, I mean, this was all formulated yeah. in phase space, okay? So this is all, I mean, I mean, you, you just do it. You introduce a metric on phase space and, uh, and you do geometry in the usual way. I mean, now you can ask what this all means, of course, right? You know, what, what, does, what does it mean to put a geometry um, on phase space? So I think that's a long discussion. Um, um, this is what Born wanted to do, right? This was the whole idea behind Born geometry, that uh, if you yes. really want to unify gravity with quantum mechanics, then you should make momentum space a curved thing. And more generally, mm -hmm. phase space should be some, some curved thing. So, um, um, well, I, I, would, I would say we, we did that. In this work, we've done that. We put, the, we put the theory, we put a curved theory on phase space, and we just, uh, just defined everything there the way you normally would um what you need to unravel then is what you know what do you make of these and what does it mean for configuration space and this result that i quoted here on my last slide um is 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 some preliminary result on that we can see how the standard ritchie curvature of of, of a space time when you do a reduction from phase space is modified so these are kind of phase space corrections Things that came from, you know, that were calculated on phase space and then projected down. Yes, exactly. I, I raised the, the, the question because uh, a Riemannian manifold uh, usually is written in terms of coordinates, uh, not momentum. Uh, if you put momentum, you are in a Fieslerian manifold, so something uh, more, more broad than Riemannian. And, and because of this, I, 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 I'm not sure how to do that, because uh, what do you do with momenta? That's my point. There is no momenta in Himanian geometry. Well, the, again, it depends what you mean by momentum, okay? 
Well, momentum, you know, momentum lives, you know, momentum and coordinates live on, live on a space. They live on, you know, um, some, uh, some manifold. So um, again, you have to, of course, you have to ask what is the significance of a metric, right? On, on momentum space or, or that on phase space. Um, and uh, ah, I see. And, this is the phase space or, 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 or no, the, well, this result relativity. I write. No, this this result I write here is on configuration space, but it's derived from phase space. Okay, that's what we said. We, I see. We, we we did a gravity theory on phase space, and then we're asking, what does that theory look like when you kind of you turn off the momentum dependence, and you project it down to something on configuration space? Okay. I see. And I'm not saying I have a complete answer to what is the meaning of that, but the first um the first optimistic result was this result for the Ritchie tensor because it's real valued. That's a big thing. That sounds a bit mm -hmm. trivial to be saying that, but if, if, if you know a bit about non-commutative gravity in the conventional setting, this is a non-trivial result because usually Ritchie tensors are complex in non-commutative gravity. And in fact, the, 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 the phase space avatar of this, this quantity is a complex object. What's remarkable is when you project it down to configuration space, um, the imaginary part goes away. The imaginary part all depends wow. on momentum. So it's, I, see. Uh, I, find, I find this a very optimistic result that uh, mm -hmm. you get something physically sensible on the space time by looking at geometry up, on, uh, up in the uh, phase space. But for sure, there's there's a lot there's a lot of like there are a lot of conceptual things to think about. But mm -hmm. I, but te technically, I don't see it. There's no problem. There's no problem technically. Yes. So instead of 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 uh, Planck constant, you are using some length constant, uh, length fundamental constant, right? Yeah. This this is the string length here, right? So this is uh, ah, the string I length. See. So these are these are the, these depend on both this flux, which controls the non-associativity, and the string length. So this is a stringy, mm -hmm. really like a stringy correction over here. Yeah. Now I understand what what you did there. That's very interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting result, um, and but I, I should also stress that at a technical level, this is you know, this is kind of pages and pages of calculation. the The yeah. problem with the the, the problem with the non associative theory, as nice and you know as much as I'm trying to push it, um, the, it's a le it's really levels and complexity above the non commutative case when it comes to calculations. So, yes, okay. So uh, uh, we, we, are, we are finishing here, no more questions. So I'll give you the word again to your final comments. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure to have you here. Right, Thank okay, well, much. it was great, great to uh, participate uh, in this. Um, you know, it, it's uh, all, these, all these technological things breaking down once in a while <laughs> and maybe adding a bit of color to the talk. But, uh, uh, but well, thank you once again for, um, uh, for the invitation, it was nice to have a uh, have a couple of hours uh, interaction, and I I, I I certainly hope we can, uh, um, you know, we, we do get a chance to meet up in the in the not so distant uh, future because it you know it's it's still it's still clearly not a not a not a substitute for um, for one to one uh, meetings, and I'm 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 pretty certain that the uh, um, you know question sessions are also. Uh, you know, the, the don't happen quite as fluently as that. But thank you very much. Uh, and I, w I wish everybody, I hope everybody uh, to st uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, um, and all the best uh, uh, for uh, w hopefully 2021 will be a much better year for uh, for for the whole planet, let's say. Uh, yeah. Okay, so that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Okay. So we end here. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.